Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is apologizing after the UK released a new report on parties that he attended during the nation's lockdown. The report says some of those gatherings failed to observe the basic protocols expected of the entire British population at the time. We have a live report coming up. North Korea is ramping up its missile tests, launching its most powerful missile in years. That missile fired from a site near China's border reached an altitude of 1,200 miles and traveled nearly 500 miles before landing in the sea. It has the potential to pose a serious threat to its neighbors from South Korea to Guam and U.S. troops stationed in the region. And the Northeast is digging out after a nor'easter dumped more than 30 inches of snow in some areas. Boston made history Saturday, tying its record for the biggest one-day snowfall at 23.6 inches. In coastal regions, entire neighborhoods are blanketed in ice after getting hit by powerful waves. And travel plans were disrupted nationwide. More than 5,000 flights were canceled over the weekend. And the mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut, has suspended two police officers under investigation for failing to follow police policies in casing, cases involving the deaths of two black women. Lauren Smithfield's family says police mishandled the investigation into her death. The officer in charge of supervising the investigation retired on Friday. The mayor says that case and the investigation into the death of Brenda Lee Rawls, who died the same day, have been reassigned to other officers. And as we mentioned, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is now apologizing as he faces pressure to resign over parties he attended at Downing Street during the nation's strict lockdown. A new report calls the gatherings a, quote, serious failure to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the heart of the government, but also of the standards expected of the entire British population at the time. ABC's Will Reeve is in London with the latest on that. Well, we heard Boris Johnson there go before Parliament and both apologizing but also trying to defend himself and the job that he's done as Prime Minister. How did he do there? That's right, Diane. He began apologetic and then pivoted to proud and then ended defiant. And he kept referencing that all that he really cared about going forward was getting on with the job. But he did begin by saying, firstly, I want to say that I'm sorry. He acknowledged the sacrifices that so many people in Great Britain and around the world have had to make amid COVID while there was the backdrop of members of Johnson's staff within 10 Downing Street hosting gatherings with alcohol when England was enduring some of the strictest COVID lockdowns anywhere in the world at the time. It's been a contentious afternoon here in Parliament. Johnson defending himself against members of the opposition parties, including Theresa May. She resigned as prime minister that led to Boris Johnson taking office two and a half years ago. And when she stood up for questioning, she said that the prime minister either didn't understand the rules or didn't think that they applied to Den 10 Downing Street. And Johnson, every time he was questioned, just kept referring to that report from Sue Gray, saying that that contained the answers and that the fuller police investigation that will be released soon would contain more. And he kept touting his record on jobs, on the response to COVID, even referencing that Britain stands with its NATO allies on the doorstep of Russia amid the Ukraine issue there very defiantly, very proudly defending his record and trying to pivot to move forward rather than focusing on what has happened over the past 20 months that included a lot of parties and behavior that the report found to be highly inappropriate. And so what are the chances that Johnson actually steps down or is removed from power at this point? Short answer, slim. A little more complex of an answer, here's what would need to happen. 54 members of Johnson's own conservative party would need to send a letter to the party chair triggering a vote of no confidence when it hits that 54-member threshold. And then that vote would be held and would just need a simple majority for Johnson to have to resign or to be removed from power. But based on the way Johnson is positioning himself, the way he has been speaking in Parliament today, that looks very slim. He is holding on and keeps coming back to the idea of getting on with the job, which he, of course, and his party seem to want him to do, and opposition and many members of the British public seem opposed to. Diane? All right. Will Reeve in London for us. Thanks, Will. Meanwhile, the U.N. Security Council is meeting on the threat of a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield says Russia intends to use the 100,000 troops currently on Ukraine's border, but that there is still a chance to find a diplomatic way out.
the United States, along with our European allies and partners and other nations around the globe, concerned by Russia's threat to Ukraine, have continued to do everything we can to resolve this crisis peacefully. In all of these talks, our messages have been clear and consistent. We seek the path of peace. We seek the path of dialogue. We do not want confrontation, but we will be decisive, swift, and united should R Russia further invade Ukraine. Well, Director Rick Klein, for more on all of this, Rick, Russia and the U.S. have very different versions, at least at this meeting, of what is going on right now. Russia essentially saying that this is megaphone diplomacy and that the U.S. is making something out of nothing. So why do they have 100,000 troops at the border of Ukraine, if not to do something with those troops? Well, that is the big question that you heard the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. try to highlight, to say, look, this is a, we're talking about combat troops, we're talking about the numbers we haven't seen in decades in Europe. You don't do this unless you're planning some kind of offensive invasion. It's not like Ukraine's about to invade Russia. Now, Russia can say, rightfully, they've got the right to do whatever they want to do on their soil, but the U.S. can monitor all of this and say uh, there's, it's hard to discern any kind of uh, motivation other than uh, a possible preparation around an invasion. Now, maybe it's all a big bluff. Maybe this is Putin trying to get attention. Maybe he, he, his intention is to get the foot off the gas at the end of this, but the provocative language from both sides would suggest otherwise, and I think the, the, the way that the White House has handled this in trying to put as much information forward as possible, make as clear as possible our expectation that an invasion could happen as soon as next month, all of it adds in the same direction, and you haven't had anything on the, on the part of the Russians for them to be able to say there's no way, no how this happens. It would fit in with what else Putin has said about uh, his, his, his ambitions, uh, the rightful territory in his view of what Russia should, should control, and and his past action. All of it adds in the same direction, which is why that case is being brought today to the United Nations. So what kind of an outcome can we expect from all of this? Is the U.S. going to get what they want ultimately? Or, or what happens with Russia's veto power in all of this? Well, that's just it. Russia can veto anything that the Security Council wants to do. Uh, therefore, there is no chance, no realistic scenario of anything substantial emerging from this. And in fact, the U.S. really isn't pursuing that. This is about highlighting diplomacy. This is about showing the world community and the Russians uh, and its allies how united major powers are uh, across the across the globe. Uh, there's nothing that, that is going to come out of the Security Council other than the, the pathway of future diplomacy that might strengthen the U.S. hand because of the allies there were, were working with. The full expectation is that anything substantial put forward would be vetoed by the Russians. And that's why I think you haven't even heard a lot of specificity put forward by the U.N. ambassador or the or President Biden, for that matter, in terms of what the, the United Nations can do. We all know that Russia holds that veto and it's almost certainly would use it uh, in any kind of scenario of, uh, of, of concrete action. All right. Our political director, Rick Klein. Rick, thank you. And President Biden is facing some tough numbers in our latest ABC News Ipsos poll. 75% of Americans are negative about the state of the economy. Just 29% support sending U.S. ground troops to Europe to counter Russian aggression against Ukraine. Meanwhile, when it comes to the Supreme Court vacancy, more than three out of four question the president's pledge to consider only black women for the seat. Our senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. With the president's first Supreme Court nomination looming, the political pressure is on. Biden has promised to name the first black woman to the court, but that latest polling shows more than three quarters of Americans want the president to consider all possible nominees. Key Republican Senator Susan Collins says she would welcome a black woman on the court, but is critical of Biden's approach. The way that the president has handled this nomination has been clumsy at best. It adds to the further perception that the court is a political institution. The chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee coming to the president's defense. This is not the first time that a president has signaled what they're looking for in a nominee. They're all going to face the same close scrutiny. This is a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land. ABC News has learned there are at least 14 black women under consideration, including Judge J. Michelle Childs of the U.S. District Court of South Carolina. The White House over the weekend confirming she's on the list when they postponed her confirmation hearing for another position. She has the backing of Biden's close ally, Congressman Jim Clyburn, and even Republican Lindsey Graham supports her. I can't think of a better person uh, for uh, President Biden to consider for the Supreme Court than Michelle Childs. 
Now, we do expect this to move fairly quickly. The president has said he's going to be holding in-person interviews here at the White House with the potential candidates and that he will announce his decision before the end of next month. While up on the Hill, lawmakers are back in session and the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee says they are ready to move on this as soon as the president makes his decision. Diane. All right, Mary Bruce, thanks for that. And a former teacher from Kansas is in a Virginia federal court today accused of leading an all-female ISIS brigade in Syria. Prosecutors say she plotted an attack on a college campus here in the U.S. Our chief justice correspondent Pierre Thomas is there following the case. Hi, Pierre. Diane, good morning. In a few hours, Allison Fluke Ekron is expected to make her first appearance at the courthouse behind me. The FBI says Fluke Ekron, who once led a modest life in Kansas homeschooling her children, became a radical leaving the U.S. for Syria, where she rose to the ranks of ISIS and became the leader of an all-female military unit. The FBI claims she dreamed of returning home and killing scores of Americans here in the U.S., allegedly plotting to blow up college students with a backpack full of explosives and to detonate a car bomb at a busy shopping mall. Luke Ekron allegedly trained in Syria from 2014 to 2017 before she was captured on the battlefield. On Friday, she was transferred to FBI custody and brought here to Alexandria to face terrorism charges, one of few women ever accused of being this involved in ISIS terror. Diane. All right, Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas in Alexandria, Virginia for us. Thanks, Pierre. Coming up, Joe Rogan is now responding after a number of artists pulled their music from Spotify to protest his alleged spread of COVID misinformation. Hear Rogan's response and what it could mean for the streaming platform when we come back. Welcome back. Joe Rogan is responding after a number of artists, including Neil Young and Joni Mitchell, pulled their music from Spotify. The artists say they're protesting the platform due to Rogan's Spotify podcast, saying he's spreading COVID misinformation. Chris Connolly has that story. Joe Rogan defending his embattled Spotify podcast, trying to respond to the firestorm that has seen rocker Neil Young. There is no and a growing number of musical allies pulling their recordings from the site in a battle over the star podcaster and his alleged spreading of COVID vaccine and treatment misinformation on the Joe Rogan experience, including promoting the drug ivermectin, despite FDA warnings that it's not been shown to help with COVID-19 and may be dangerous. Rogan seeking to take issue with the misinformation label, despite the unsubstantiated statements made by some of his guests. I do not know if they're right. I don't know because I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a person who sits down and talks to people and has conversations with them. Do I get things wrong? Absolutely, I get things wrong, but I try to correct them. Whenever I get something wrong, gonna sing an old song. It began with the 76 year old Young. Declaring on his website that Spotify could have Rogan or me, not both, because Spotify is spreading fake information about vaccines potentially causing death, echoing detailed objections made by 270 experts in an open letter to Spotify weeks ago. Kennedy Center honoree Joni Mitchell saying she'll pull her music from Spotify, saying irresponsible people are spreading lies that are costing people their lives. Prince Harry and Meghan, recipients of a $30 million Spotify podcast deal, expressing concerns. But you and I know what this world Guitarist Nils Lofgren of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, pulling some 27 years worth of his solo work off the site. I think specifically a lot of times on Joe's show, they encourage the wrong thing and it's disingenuous and uh, dangerous at times. And uh, we felt like we had no choice but to stand with Neil. Spotify losing billions in market value last week, and the CEO saying the site will add a content advisory to COVID podcasts while directing listeners to a COVID-19 hub with facts and information on the virus. So we'll see about Joe Rogan. One more possibly relevant note, as young people growing up in Canada, both Joni Mitchell and Neil Young were stricken with polio before there was a vaccine. 
life-changing moment for both of them. Diane? All right, Chris Connolly, thanks for that. And I want to bring in Sirius XM radio host and ABC News contributor Mike Muse for more on the impact of this whole controversy. Uh, Mike, Spotify took a steep loss in market value last week, which a lot of people are pointing to this, but lots of other stocks also took a huge dip last week. Um, Rogan, as controversial as he may be, he is a huge draw. So how do you see this whole thing playing out? Well, first, Diane, it's so great to be in conversation with you again. Oh, Welcome good back. to see you too, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, as always, you ask such great questions. I think what's making this so interesting and why I'm fascinated is because, as you know, Diane, I love technology and I love focusing on AI and machine learning and big data and really getting to the tech policy aspect of this. And what we're seeing right now is I think listeners and viewers are understanding now that Spotify isn't necessarily like a music company. It's not a record label. It's not a Def Jam. It's not, you know, a Columbia or a Sony. It is a tech company company, Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, they're tech platforms. And what these tech platforms are now are wrestling with, I believe, actually, for the first time is what is the responsibility for the user and then what's the responsibility for the creator? In Spotify's statement, they say that it is our responsibility to create a safe space, but at the same time, getting freedom of expression to our creators. And then that goes into the Constitution, you know, what allows for freedom of expression, freedom of speech, right? But when does freedom of expression and freedom of speech begin to infringe on others when it comes to a disinformation, and then does that become dangerous. And I think that is the crux of what we're happening here with, with, with Joe Rogan. Spotify is trying to protect the freedom of their creators, like Joe Rogan and others, while at the same time making sure that they're able to keep their listeners uh, with, with accurate information. It's no different than when Twitter uh, began to put marks uh, when individuals, elected officials, would spread disinformation, right? And so I think Spotify is going to have to start getting to that area more directly, more poignantly, and actually more quicker. But then also, too, you seeing on the flip side, creators are making a conscious decision to pull. Uh, and I think this is just a new space that we're seeing for these music tech companies. Um, and we're seeing it play out in real time. And because it's a tech company, it does tend toward a younger user. So I wonder, now that we're hearing from Prince Harry and Meghan, for example, who have a $30 million podcast deal with Spotify, now they're expressing some concerns. They kept the language there vague. But I wonder, does that move the needle at all? Absolutely. I mean, the fact that not only Neil Young, but you're seeing Jordy Mitchell, you're seeing individuals from Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. You're starting to see, you know, Prince Harry uh, and Meghan Markle begin uh, to consider possibly pulling their podcast. Now, if we see creators on the other side now start to pull their music uh, and their podcast, that actually impacts Spotify's bottom line too, as well. Because young consumers, the average age, I believe, of Joe Rogan's, Joe Rogan's podcast is 24 years old. Uh, young users are the ones who are typically using Spotify, and they're what you consider to be your sticky consumers. They keep coming back over and over and over again, and that's what drives Spotify's bottom line. Although that a music company, music does drive them in order to get users to the platform, in order to download these podcasts. So if more creators and artists begin to pull their music, but then that counters the powerful impact of Joe Rogan's 11 million viewers or listeners per episode. Uh, that counters that and makes it neutral. Uh, and then Spotify Spotify has to make a choice. Do they keep holding on to this podcaster, right? Uh, or do they allow other creatives to pull uh, their music and their podcast? Uh, but right now, we don't see, I don't believe we see enough uh, for Spotify to make that really critical decision of, of what to do. But if more influential individuals, artists, and podcasters make that decision, Spotify's going to have a tough decision to make, Joe Rogan or the creators. And the CEO of Spotify also came out addressing this and said the site will add a content advisory to all COVID podcasts. Rogan himself also said that he's going to do a better job of balancing things out. And after he has controversial people, Han, who will have other experts to counter whatever that person said. What do you think of that response? Is it enough? You know, I don't know. It's a, we would know if it's enough if we start seeing more content creators pull their site. Uh, at the end, streaming, it's all about the number of downloads per episode. And as Spotify being a bottom line that has to be beholden to their investors and has to get a return on their investment, they're looking at that 11 million uh, downloads per episode. Uh, that is part of their advertising revenue. Uh, that is part of what allows them to make more deals with other content creators and multi-million dollar deals. Uh, 
I mean, that's a hard thing to let go. Um, but I do believe that the CEO is on the right path in doing that. Uh, but we'll see it's, if it's enough and how the, the other consumers get involved. Our consumers right now uh, across the country are really activists when you think about it. Like, they really want to know what a company's constitution is uh, before they decide to support or, beside the, or they decide to not to support anymore. So uh, I think it's, we'll know in the next coming weeks if that was enough. And you're going to start to see activist consumers coming out on both sides of this debate, Mike, that's for sure. Mike Muse, we always appreciate you. Thank you, friend. Thanks, Diane. See you soon. And coming up, Real Housewives star Erica Jane is claiming victory in the embezzlement lawsuit she's facing. We have the latest on her legal battle and what's new on that after the break. Welcome back. Real Housewife Erica Jane has been dismissed from the lawsuit against her estranged husband, Tom Girardi. Girardi is accused of embezzling millions of dollars from victims in the 2018 Lion Air plane crash. Zoreen Shah has the details. But they're also looking at it through their own eyes. Real Housewife of Beverly Hills, Erica Jane, maintaining her innocence. If he stole the money, I'd like to know where it is. The lawsuit against her in Illinois dismissed. The reality star appearing to claim victory on Instagram, thanking her supporters, writing, thank you to my friends that know me. It's a marathon. She had been named in a lawsuit with her now ex-husband, disgraced legal titan Tom Girardi, who was accused of embezzling millions of dollars from victims in the 2018 Lion Air plane crash. Her legal troubles and divorce playing out on TV. The strongest substance on earth isn't diamonds. It's me. But when questioned, Erica saying she did nothing wrong and was in the dark when it came to their finances. I did nothing wrong, but I'm not going to answer that question. Even agreeing that the victims deserve the money. I'm in an almost impossible situation. And anyone that has been wronged, I want them to be made whole. Her lawyer saying in a statement, the truth is that Erica had no role in the Lion Air dealings, actions or inaction as between the attorneys and their clients, and she never received any of the Lion Air client settlement funds. While the lawsuit has been dismissed from court in Illinois, she is not out of the woods. The plaintiff has not only vowed to um, recharge and, and refile in California, but they've said that based on her statements and her public stance that they intend now to be able to prove that she not only knew and knowingly benefited, but that she was part of it all along. Chicago firm Edelson PC, who is representing some of the plane crash victims, will refile in California, telling ABC News Erica and her team have put out a false story that we abandoned our case against her and EJ Global. Adding, Erica is quite shockingly turning into a modern-day version of Marie Antoinette before our eyes. She should take accountability for her actions and return the money to the lying air victims. If not, we are sure we will get justice through the court system. While she's no longer a housewife by marriage, the big cliffhanger now is if she'll still be a defendant. She's still facing other lawsuits in court. Diane. All right, Zoreen Shah, thanks for that. And I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live continues with more news, context, and analysis. Stay with us. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.